if you're new here, my name is Stone Moss. I have the privilege and honor of pastoring. If you're joining us for the first time, if you're joining us for the first time online, thank you so much for joining us. We consider it an honor and privilege that you're tuning in with us today. We, um, we are a church that's on mission to see this spring, Springfield encounter God, love people, and find purpose. Um, and we believe there's more for your family. So I, wanna, I want you to join me um, in math, chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 6 today is where we're going to go. But before we go there, I'm going to give you a precursor. What are we talking about today? We're talking about money. Someone say money. Somebody's like, oh man, my first time here in church already wants my money. It's okay. We only talk about money twice a year. And uh, we're going to talk about it today because it's important. Um, Because I know this, I know that if I have money problems, I got lots of problems. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If you have money problems, you got problems everywhere else as well. Some of you, we just had a four-week marriage class, uh, marriage, marriage class, marriage series, and some of you are struggling, and I'm telling you, you're going to continue to struggle if you have money issues. So we're going to get really practical today. We're going to have fun. So just let your guard down a little bit. I'm not going to be taking up an offering that if you don't give, you don't leave blessed, and God's going to tear your whole family apart if you don't give $10,000. That's not going to happen today. So just chill. We're going to have practical fun. We're going to look at what God's scripture says about our money. And listen, I just want to let you know, this isn't a tithing sermon. This is a how to manage your money well sermon. This is how to manage what God has blessed you with sermon. Uh, I know that uh, struggling financially brings tension in every area of your life. My wife and I, we've been married for a few years now, and I can just tell you this. We've been blessed, and we've been broke. You know what I'm talking about? We've had seasons of both. We, we have too. When God first called us, when we first got married, um, I had done very well financially for myself. I had built up a business. I had uh, had lots of savings. I, had, I was very cushy. It was very great. I owned a home, and God said, plant a church. And we went from blessed to broke. Come on, somebody. We, 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 gave a, we donated a lot of money to the church, and we went through a, a season of struggle. And I can just tell you, when, you're, when you have financial struggles, it affects everything. And so the goal today is really, um, is really to, the, the title of my sermon is how to manage your money well. And so it's just, it's, it's very practical. You know, Jesus talked about two things the most in the Bible. Two things Jesus talked about more than anything else. You know what they are? Money and hell. The two things we don't talk about the most in church, money and hell. Isn't it crazy that what, what was most concerning to Jesus is least concerning to the church? It's kind of weird, but we're going to go against that today, and we're going to talk about it because it matters. It matters. The great philosopher of our day said, my mind is on my money, and my money is on my mind. Not a... Anyway, <laughs> sorry, Snoop Dogg coming out. Y'all know. Y'all know. <laughs> he said, <laughs> another wise person, Billy Graham, said, by the way, you're only going to come to Limitless Church to hear a quote from Snoop Dogg and then follow it with Billy Graham. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. If a person gets his attitude toward money straight, it will help straighten out almost every area of his life. That's what Billy Graham says. Jesus addressed money a lot in the Bible. So we're going to talk about it today. One of the most important things that he says about money is this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is... There your heart will be also. Some of you say, well, I ain't got no treasure, so I'm good. Can I just tell you, treasure is not that $100,000 sitting in your bank account collecting interest. Treasure is not your 401k that you have set up. Treasure is not even the $100. Listen, treasure is, some of you think just because you don't have lots of money that you don't have treasure. Treasure is not a a big box of gold that's, you know, hiding under the ground somewhere you got to go find like a pirate. That's not treasure. Treasure is where where, where you spend your money. That's your treasure. How you spend your money. Money, I wrote down like this, money is a great indicator of the affection of your heart. Our payments, in fact, our payments reveal our priorities. Show me your bank statement and I'll show you your passion. Show me your Venmo and I'll show you your values. What we spend our money on, what we buy, determines what are the, what we are, the indicator of the affections of our heart. And so, I, I hear people say, well, I, I really, this is going to step on some toes. That's okay. That's all right. I love Jesus. Really? Because your bank statement says you love seven brew and Target. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. No, but really, 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 Stone, Jesus has my heart. No, I'm pretty sure Amazon Prime has your heart. Yeah, you know. Candace, I see you. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Love you, Candace. Um, and some of you, some of you treat your finances, seriously, some of you treat your finances, this is very serious, don't laugh. Some of you treat your finances like this guy's treating the UPS package. Y'all know, come on. What do y'all think about this? Y'all don't know anything about no Ace Ventura. Come on, somebody, look at that. Come on, where's the music at? Where's the music at? Yeah. I'm going to just take you back. I don't condone the way that this, this next guy on the steps, I don't condone what he's doing, but just ignore him. We'll get a, I don't, that, don't look, don't look. Anyways, all right, you see how he's pick, taking, messing with the package? Watch this, my favorite part. What? <laughs> Go on. And he, and you see, some of you are, you can shut it off. Some of you guys, we're not watching the movie today. Some of you guys are treating your finances like he's treating that package. Just throwing it around, don't really know. Some of you, if I ask, if you could, some of you could not give me, uh, and, and it, you wouldn't know where every dollar that you spent last month went. Like you couldn't account for it. I was just telling the first service, I just downloaded this app a couple months ago, um, Rocket Money. And literally, if I don't code something, if I don't give it an expense, it'll email me and say, hey, this was spent at so-and-so, what should I categorize it as? And it's like, it keeps, and I'm like, man, if you realize how much money you spend on McDonald's every month, if you realize how much money you spend on call, it's crazy how we manage money and we always wonder why we don't have the ability to bless things, bless people, do what God asks us to do with our finances because we, we, we're, not, we're not managing it well. So I'm going to start today by giving you three fundamental truths. These are truths whether you like it or not. Sorry. This is the truth of the Word of God. It, it is not an opinion. I didn't create this. This came from the Word. Here are three fundamental truths about money. Are you listening? Are you ready? Okay, the first is God is the owner. God is the owner of your money. God is the owner of your house. God is the owner of your car. God is the owner. If you don't view what you have as God's, you will not treat it as such. Some of you treat your money like it's your money. Some of you talking about my 401k, talking about my house, my car. Can I just tell you? It's not yours. I'll give you some scripture. Psalms 24.1 says it like this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. So not only is your money his, hear me, so is your spouse. Your spouse ain't yours. Your spouse is his. Your kids ain't yours. Your kids are his. Your money is not yours. Your money is his. Period. Everything that is in the world is God's. Are you with me? So some of you say, well, no, pastor. I refute that. Here's why. I built this business from the ground up. God didn't touch nothing. Can I just tell you? What do you think? Who do you think gave you the brain? Who do you think gave you the capacity? Who do you think gave you the ability to wake up early, make those decisions that got you to the place that you're at today? Deuteronomy 8.18 says it like this, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gave you the ability to produce wealth. Some of you have made some money, and you think that you made that money. You did as a result of his blessing, as a result of his grace on your life, as a result of him being uh, the God who owns everything. So everything that we have and everything we produce is his. Second truth is this. We're just the managers. The Bible uses the word stewards. Stewards is a servant. A steward in the Bible is someone who manages another person's home. Think about that for a second. Like, if I hired you to come, my wife would be so happy. If I hired you to come clean my house, right, you would not be cleaning your house. You'd be cleaning my house that I paid you to do, right? God blesses you to take care of his stuff. It's not your stuff. How are you managing what God has blessed and put in your life? Are you taking care of God's house with your blessing? That's what it means. It means that we are stewards um, you ever had teenagers, you know, you had that talk, if you, if, you, if you haven't had teenagers yet, but you were a teenager, maybe you've heard this conversation or participated in this, this house ain't your house. And as long as you're in this house, come on somebody, you're going to abide by the rules of this house. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And some of us have that teenager mentality about our finances. It was like, this is mine. I have this. I, I deserve this. I ha we have this, this this, this, this teenager mentality about what is ours. It's not ours. You can, yeah, you can work, but it's not yours. God, God, it's God's. It all belongs to the Lord. And so we can't have this mentality, um, you know, so you should steward not just money, but everything that God gives you well. 
You, if you, some of you, it's been a while since you picked up a parenting book, and it shows. You need to, you need to find out how God has called you to steward your children rightly. Some of you, you, you know, you don't pick up the Bible. You read what God's Word says. You've got to steward everything that God has given you well, because it's not yours. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. This then is how you ought to regard us. As what? Servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now that it is required that those who have been given a trust must be proven faithful. In other words, you're a servant. Prove yourself faithful. Give to God what is his, rightfully his. All right, last point. Last fundamental truth. Don't care how you like it or not. It's the truth. How you, how you manage the little determines how you will manage a lot. Man, I hear this stuff. Uh, you know, everyone wants more. A lot of people want more, but they can't handle what they currently have. They're not stewarding what they currently have, but they want more. Luke 16, 10 through 11 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Good news. If you're faithful with a little, God's going to bless you with more. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Bad news. If you're dishonest with a little, you don't get more. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling your worldly wealth, uh, if you've not been entrusted with handling what God has blessed you with, here's what the Bible says. Who will trust you with true riches? Some of you, some of you have very little, okay? Can I just tell you, you can be just as faithful as someone with a lot. Some of you have a lot. And you're not giving to the Lord. You're not returning what was his. And it's not because you don't have the money. It's because you have a heart issue. It's because you, you don't see what is yours as his. And as a result, you're not treating the finances God has blessed you with with the way he's called you to, tr to treat them. In other words, uh, you know, we have people probably in this room that are naming and claiming a brand new Tahoe. Praise the Lord. I need a $68,000 SUV. Meanwhile, your 2004 minivan hasn't had an oil change in, in nine months, and you have three bald tires. Talk about, I can make the payment if I work an extra shift. I'll Uber. Listen, you need to stop drinking coffee and stop going to McDonald's for sausage biscuits, save you up some money, and get some new tires. I wrote it down like this, and no one's going to like this. It's okay, though. The floorboard of your current vehicle says whether or not you can handle a newer one. Y'all think, think I'm just talking about a vehicle, but I'm not. Think about that. We want more, but we can't handle what God has given us. Can we talk about Zillow for a minute? Because some of y'all spending hours and hours on Zillow looking at houses that are $100,000, $200,000 more than you can afford. Talking about, I can make that payment maybe if I just. And meanwhile, you got baseboards and, that hadn't been washed in six years. You got your fans that hadn't been, they got, they got this much dust on them. You got your, your, your dishwasher's broken. You ain't even fixed it. You've been hand washing dishes for like, come on somebody. Y'all taking, not taking care of what God has blessed you with, asking for more. It doesn't work that way. It, it, that's not how the kingdom works. The kingdom is, what do you have now and what are you doing with it now? And as a result of that answer, it's what God's going to bless you with in the future. Some of you guys are single and you're asking God for a spouse, but you're not successfully single yet. You're not being who God has called you to be now. So why would he send you, the Bible says it, not me. Why would he entrust you with greater riches? Why would he entrust you with a better relationship if you can't be who God has called you to be right now? This ain't just with money, it's with every area of our life. We're, we're wanting what we don't have. As a result, we say things like, well, when I get, when I get more money, I'll, I'll start giving. Listen, bro, it, I hear it all the time. If I win the lottery, I'm giving, I'm giving the church 10%. You won't give the church $10 out of your $100. What makes you think you're going to write a $100,000 check when you win a million dollars? It ain't going to happen. You know why? It's not about what you give. It's not about the amount. It's about the heart. It's a principle. It's not a commandment. I don't know who told you what pastor, but they lied. It is not a law to give 10%. It is a principle. And there's a reason why it's a principle. We're going to talk about that in, in a, little, a little bit later. I'm getting ahead of myself. But this is, this is the story. I was, this is the story of Limitless Church. Y'all know, if you've been here since the beginning, this time in January, last year, we had 90 people, maybe, that called this church their home. We had one service. We had broken equipment. A year later, we got two services. We got over 200 people that call this church their home. We're continuing to grow. We're continuing to expand. Why? Because we've been faithful with the little. I got church planner friends, man. They spent all their money when they, when they raised their funds. And they launched with zero money. Not our story. 
We were, we've been faithful with the little, and that's why, guess what? This time next year, we're either going to be in a different building. We're going to either have four services. I don't know what we're going to do, but it's going to be better than now because we're being faithful with the little. And as a result, God's going to bless us with more. It's kingdom. It's kingdom. So we, are, we, have to be, we have to be concerned about handling what God has given us better, okay? I call it the, the plate predicament. Anyone who has kids in the room? Yeah, y'all, y'all know then. Y'all know what this is right here. Yes, yeah, sir. This thing has a suction cup on it. Why? Because a one-year-old is not ready to have a plate that's not suctioned to the table. Why? Because they're going to throw They don't know what a plate's for. They don't know how to use this thing. So you put the flute on there, and they're like, you know, trying to move. They can't because it's suctioned to the table. Because a child that's one years old is not ready for this. Because what happens if the, you give a child that's one years old this, they're going to knock it off the table. They're going to not treat it right. Some of you, this is where you're at financially. God has blessed you enough to get by, but you, you don't think that your, you know, your 10% is only $230 a month. The church, what is the church going to do with that? So as a result, you're not treating the very basics of what God, so he can't, he can't give you more. But you see what happens is when you're faithful, and when my one-year-old realizes that this is a plate, that we don't throw this plate. We, we, we eat from this plate. Oh, okay, guess what? They get an upgrade. They get the plastic plate. Y'all think that's good because that's what God's done in your life. He's given you a plastic plate. You got a promotion. Praise the Lord. But guess what? You decided that now I'm not going to increase my giving because that's just a little bit too much. So guess what? It's just the same as a two-year-old who gets a plastic plate. They know how the plate works, but they don't like vegetables, and the parent Bless God gave them vegetables. So what do they do with the plate? They throw the plate. You know why? Because it's got something they don't like on it. And so now what they've been taught, what they've been trained for, it doesn't matter. It's gone out because it's uncomfortable. And some of you, that's exactly where you're at. God has blessed you with something that is, that is comfortable, but you're not willing to be, do your part anymore. So as a result, you lose and you got to go back. Some of you 35, 40, 50 years old, and you keep going, you're in this cycle of plastic to, to suction cup, plastic to suction. You never get past this stage because you can't be faithful what God has given you. Are you with me? So let's pretend that this child of mine who's two years old and would never throw a plate, um, he, get, he gets upgraded because now he's six years old. Some of you guys, you, 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 you matured in life. And you, you, you went through the suction cup phase, and you were faithful. You got through the plastic phase in your face. Now you're, now you're six years old, man. You're a, you're, a, you're a toddler that knows, right? Is that a toddler? I think. Anyways, you know how to handle your food until your parent says, no TV the rest of the night. What? You mean, huh? No iPad, no screen time, whatever it is. You are, and this reflects your life. You've been upgraded. Everything's going good in your life until all of a sudden, you get hit with a $20,000, you got to replace your air conditioning unit in your whole house. What? You mean what, God? And you got blessed with something that, was, that you were ready for. You were tithing. You were giving. You were doing everything you were supposed to do, bless God. And you were upgraded to something great. But then when you get it and you're not faithful with it, you're never beyond going back. You're never going to be going backwards. And as a result, here's what happens. A lot of you in this room today, I know for a fact, you have been blessed. God has blessed you tremendously. And as a result, there there's might be things in your life that you think, well, I'm just, I just can't afford a time. I can't do that. It's the same as a six-year-old says, I want screen time. No, son, you can't have it. But I want it. I don't care. You're not getting it. But why? And they break it because they're not ready for it. And so here's what happens. Our life looks like this today. Our life is a mess. We can't figure out why. We keep going back and forth. We're struggling. We're not struggling. And God has blessed us with something, but we end up breaking it because we weren't ready for it. Y'all want more? This is what your more ends up if God gives it before you're ready. Some of you guys are ready for a major blessing in your life, but you can't have it because God knows that's what it's going to end up as. Broke, messed up because you throw a tinder tantrum because you don't like it. I can't tell you how many times I, 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 I've heard people say, well, I will give, but I'm not going to give this much because if something happens, I, that's not what the Bible says. It says, be good stewards of what you have now, and as a result, you'll be blessed. And if you don't, you're going to end up like this, broken, divorced. Nah, that's just what we say. Oh, he's talking about if I don't tithe, I'm going to get divorced. No, I'm saying if you're not faithful to what God has given you, you're going to lose it. I don't care what it is, money, a relationship. 
fame, popularity, I don't care. If you don't steward what God has given you well, you will break it. When you give something of value to someone who can't handle it, they will break it. If I give my six-year-old something he can't handle, he will break it. God wants to bless you today, but he can't because he knows you're going to break it. What happens when you start being faithful with what you have? This ain't a, y'all, y'all got confused. Y'all thought I was talking about the prosperity gospel. No, no, no. I'm not saying that if you give, you're going to get a $10,000 check in the mail. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you give, though, you will be blessed, period. I'm saying if you're helping that person in the drive-thru that God says, hey, they need, they need help today, and you pay for that. If you're at the grocery store and you see someone, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you being faithful and handling what God has given you well. Handle the little well, and God will give you more. That's just the way that it works. So as a result, I'll just tell you that before I give you these three things, I'm going to give you three things. I just told you fundamental truths. I can't change that. I'm sorry. Those are just what the Bible says. I'm going to give you three fundamental truths now, or excuse me, three commitments that you can make that I believe that I found in Scripture that can help you. Okay? Y'all want to know what they are? Okay. So before I do this, can I just say there's a reason why I'm teaching this today. I need you to be more blessed. God's kingdom needs you to be more blessed. Jesus wants you more blessed so that you can be a blessing. So it's very important that I, I want you to make more money. That's what I'm saying. Because I want you to be blessed because I want God to be able to multiply your gift in the life of others. Are you with me? Okay, so here's why it's important. Here's what you have to do. Commitment number one, you've got to start spending wisely. Can I tell you? 95% of the people in this room, you don't have an income problem. You have a spending problem. There's a big difference between an income problem and a spending problem. A lot of us, we think it's a spending problem because we don't have no money. No, no, no. Excuse me. Uh, we think it's a, what I say? You think it's a, a, an income problem. You're making, I know that the, the all, you read all the things, it's like the, the cost of living is higher than it's ever. Not, yes, it is, for, for sure. However, if you actually look at what your money goes to and you, you know, bring it down to what you're spending, to what you should be, all that stuff, I promise you, 95% of the people don't have an income problem. They have a spending problem. And some of the crazy stats for America, for Americans, I read this this week, it's going to blow your mind. A hundred billion dollars is spent in America, just America alone. A hundred billion dollars is spent on lottery tickets. One hundred billion. Y'all, we can't even fathom how much money that is. Every year. Every year. One hundred billion. Y'all, just give that money to church. I promise you. Like, you'll be blessed. Like, you'll get more return from that. I promise you. It just will. Just, just do it. Trust me. All right. Um, uh, two, two, listen, two billion dollars. All these are billions. So I know it's, but just go there mentally. Billion. Two billion is used on unused gym memberships. Y'all know who you are. Talking about, I'm going to go next month. Yeah. <laughs> Cancel that thing. Y'all be spending too much money on unused gym memberships, all right? Two are $15 billion on bank fees. On bank fees, like of all things, like you get charged because you withdrew from your savings account too many times, 35 bucks. I don't know, sorry. That all adds up. What about this? This makes me sick. $100 billion on crystals to help people stay calm. Y'all give that money to the church. I promise you what I have for you can make you more calm than those crystals. I promise. Y'all talking about $100 billion? $1 billion? That's an insane amount of money to make you feel calm. Listen, I got one prayer, and it will do much better than those crystals. Y'all want to support the bill? I promise you. I, I promise you what I got is better, okay? Buy me, not those crystals. Anyways, all right. Three, <laughs> not me, the church. Um, $300, $380 billion in in-app purchases. Some of you buying the free app, and then you end up spending $100 in the app. It's crazy. These, when you start thinking how much this is, tw- the average American spent $2,300 on coffee last year. $2,300. Woo, that's a lot of money. Check this out. Cat owners spend on average $270 a month. I'm just saying, get rid of your cat. I don't regret saying that. As a result, this is what our life is, man. We just, we just spend in the money. Yeah, I, you know what? Matter of fact, I don't want the commercials. Let me, get, let me get no commercials. Matter of fact, I think I'll get my nails done. 
four times this month instead of twice. Matter of fact, I think I'll take this. I think I, I've been wanting this for a while, but I ain't saved for it. But I'm just going to go ahead and spend it anyways. Because you know what? Great, you know, it'll come back to me next month, you know. And we, we treat it like an Olympic sport to spend every dollar we get until the day we get paid. By the time the next day is, we spent so much money. We're just making it rain, bro. Making it rain. And as a result, here's what happens. At the end of the week, this is what our life looks like. Hey, uh, Angela, I need you to, I need you to bless um, that person. They, they've been struggling. You've seen them come into church. You know they're struggling. I just need you to bless them this week with some grocery money. You can't because you spent all your money. Hey, um, uh, Angela, uh, Limitless Church is having an expansion offering in, in July to, to help save for a building. I need you to give to that. You ain't got no money. You ain't got no money to bless what the, the God who's given you the money in the first place because you've spent all of your money. You've spent all the resources God has given you, and they're, you're empty. When he asks you to give, Luke 14, 28 says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? So what's the solution? What's the solution, Pastor? The solution is get on a budget. It's that simple. Get on a strict budget. I, I, you know, I, I, it's, some of you started January talking about, I'm going to get on a budget, and it's March. That's why we're having it now, because you don't quit. Okay? You don't quit your budget. Can I just tell you, there's something really healthy, all the men in the room. If your budget tells your wife no, it's not you telling her no. It helps. Okay? If my wife comes to me and says, hey, you know, I'd like to get my nails done. Okay, baby, how many times is that this month? Well, I want to do it three. Sorry, baby, budget said no. Who's budget? You know what I'm saying? The budget says no and not me. Then I can't get in trouble. I'm just saying, if we get on a budget, I promise you, it will help your life. Can I just tell you this? Someone's going to tune in online for the first time. Like, what is going on at this church? <laughs> they got money on the ground. Um, and they're, most of them are ones. <laughs> uh, all right. Every spending si- decision, hear me, every spending decision is a spiritual decision. Some of you all missed that completely. So I'm going to tell you again. Every spending decision is a spiritual one. How can you say that? Because everything you own belongs to God. So what you're spending your money on is a spiritual decision. We got to get past it. Listen, I'm not teaching this message because I, can I just say this? I told the first service, and you could ask the board members of our church, we are doing very well financially. We don't need a a plethora of money. I'll just say it this way. I'm not up here because we need it. I'm up here because you need this. You need to be more blessed. And you are going to get more blessed as a result of this. We're, we're just a byproduct of God blessing you. So I, I've learned this. I don't, well, I, first of all, I don't want you to hear this message and you walk around feeling guilty all week. Listen, I never want to be a manipulating church. We've taken up one special offering at this church. It was our legacy offering. And I gave people six weeks in advance to pray for it. Six weeks. Every week I reminded them. Because I didn't want it to be an emotional decision. I don't want you to give out of emotion. I want you to give out of obedience. There's a difference. And so I've learned that what's, ever, what's, what's important to me, I automate. What's important, what I, is important to me, I automate. That means my mortgage is automated. You know why? Because it's important that my family has a roof over their head. So I'm going to automate that. That's coming out of my account whether I want it to or not. You know what else is automated? My electricity. It, it doesn't matter how much it is. It could be $500, could be $97. It is set up on automatic drafts. It is going to come out of my account every month whether I want it to or want. Why? Because it's important. It's important that I have electricity for my kids. Some of you guys, I'm just telling you, some of you are not on a fixed income. I get that. But if you will automate what's important to you, if it's important to you, you should automate it. That's all I'm saying. Okay? Automate what's important to you. If, if God is first in your life, automate your tithe. If your mortgage is important to you, automate your mortgage. Listen, this ain't just tithe. If you've got things in your life that you're late on, stop automate that junk like just put it on make it come out so that you're not spending money that you don't have number two which leads me to my second point not only do you have to spend wisely you've got to save diligently well some of y'all don't like that either because now i'm talking about i can't spend this now i'm actually telling you you got a savings yeah you got to put money away that you don't use ain't that a thought right like i realize that a lot of us treat it like we get it and we're like how quickly can we spend this we treat it as a sport bro 
We talk about, man, I want to get to zero faster than you. That's an awful way to live. It's an awful way to live paycheck to paycheck. I've lived it. It's an awful way to live. We got we to gotta start saving our money. I, I, I read about a church a couple years ago. They were a church that experienced one of the greatest revivals in this nation ever. And hundreds of thousands of people all over the world traveled to this church in the 90s in Florida. And um, I was reading this thing about them. They, while they had all those people and God was pouring out his spirit, it was incredible. The things that they were, the miracles they were saying, all these things. But behind closed doors, they were not managing the money well. Now, I'm not talking fraud. There was no fraud. They just weren't managing it well. And some of you guys, you're not bad people. You're just not managing your money well. And as a result, this church that had thousands and thousands of people in it, I'm talking about seven days a week, five and six services a day for seven days a week for years. It was a revival. Guess what? At the end of that, they ended up with 300 people. 300 people paying an $84,000 interest-only mortgage payment. Per month, $84,000 interest only. They had taken so many loans out against the, their building. They, they, were, they were literally $12 million in debt at its worst point. In the 90s. That's like now money, that's like $80 million. <laughs> that's a lot of money in debt. My point is, when I read that, I was like, that's not going to be the story of Limitless Church. We're not going to be a church. I'm not going to be a person. That I don't have, if, if I'm not going to go into panic mode if, I don't, if something breaks in my house and I can't provide. I'm not going to do that. This ain't going to be a church. I told you this week, I'll, I'll just tell you. I haven't asked the board if this is okay, but I'm sure they wouldn't mind. We spent $10,000 this week, almost $10,000. Did y'all hear about it? Did I come before the church? Hey, y'all, we have some, some equipment. We have storage issues. Every week when we travel the trailer back and forth, we're breaking things because it's just not... Equipment's not made to move back and forth, and we, we really need new camera lens, and also there's lights in the back that's broke, and when people view us on camera, they can't hear us because the sound is bad, and I need to, all, y'all didn't, I, can y'all give to that, please? I didn't say that. Why? Why is this the first you're hearing about it? Because we have done right with the money at this church. We've stewarded it rightly. So when we need something, we have the money to buy that. We have a brand new 40-foot storage container out there that isn't going to move this week. It's stationary. It's right there. We have, you're going to see by Easter, we're, we're upgrading our, our, our sound, our video, our visual. Why? Because so we can reach people better. We are doing everything that God is calling us to do. And as a result, he's blessing us. And I'm not having to ask you to give more. I'm not having to sit up here and say, hey, guys, we're in need. And so many times, I, you know, I think that that's where, you know, churches can really kind of like mess up. I don't like that. In fact, the Bible says, tells us something different. In Proverbs 21, 20, it says, The wise store up choice food and, and, and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. We're, if we're spending all the money and we're not saving it, we're fools. We're fools. I, you know, <clears throat> I told you I know pastors who planted the same years as us and they're broke. We, we saved our money, man. We wanted better cameras. We wanted more comfortable seats. Some of y'all say, why didn't you get the comfortable seats? <laughs> Sorry, we were saving money. We were going to steward what God gave us rightfully. And so we saved every, everything that comes into this church. Last year, we saved 20, almost 20% of everything that came into this church was saved. Some of y'all haven't saved 20% of your income ever. We did it in our first year of operation. 20% was saved. Almost 20%. It's like 19 something. It's crazy. Can you imagine if you saved 20% of what you made this year? Some of y'all are going to calculate that up tonight and figure out. You would be rich. <laughs> You'd have some money in the account. If you saved 20% of what you made this year, we did it our first year. And that's what we're going to continue to do. We're going to continue to operate. 10% of everything that comes to this church gets saved. 10% of, uh, so 20% of everything that comes to this church is already accounted for. It's 10% for savings. 10% goes right back out to, to world missions. We as a church tithe and we as a church save. I wouldn't be asking you to do anything if I didn't believe in it myself. My wife and I, we save 10% of everything that comes in, and we give 10% of our income every month. I, again, I wouldn't ask you to do something. What is that called? When I'm at, uh, it's called planning for your future by being faithful now. You need to plan for your future by being faithful right now. So I wrote it down like this. Discipline is saying no to good things so that you can say yes to God things. Some of you guys are not saying yes to God things. 
You're saying yes to good things. I told my wife on Legacy Sunday, I listened to her in the mirror and said, I love you, babe, but I don't think we're going to be able to go on vacation this year because of what I'm about to give to Legacy. Some of y'all weren't here for that, but we did it in December. I told my wife that. Can I just tell you two weeks ago, I booked our vacation. We going. You know why? Because God takes care of the faithful. Every time. We go into the Dominican, baby. Six days, baby. Let's go. Yeah, I'm so excited. But, I'm so, but listen, God blesses me because I'm faithful with the small. And he's going to continue to do it. And guess what? This church is going to look different than it does right now next year. Why? Because we're being faithful. And I want, guess what? I want your life to be different this time next year. I want you looking back and thinking, I made a simple decision, and I thought it was going to hurt me, and it actually set me way above the rest. Amen? All right. It's my third point. I haven't even talked about giving yet. Now I'm going to talk about giving. The third thing you have to do is you've got to sow generously. That sounds so counterintuitive to what the world teaches us. To give? Uh, to get? I got to give? Yeah. That's called kingdom. Okay? It's planting seed. Uh, uh, this quote by C.S. Lewis, um, <clears throat> I think the, the first service had to read it like eight times <laughs> before they understood it. <laughs> Maybe you all get it. It says, I do not believe one can settle on how much we ought to give. I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. Think about that. To give more than we can spare. How many of you give more than you can spare? I mean, truly. Think about it. It's powerful. I, I told you in December, you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. I got people, I got people in my inner circle that, that I, I, they don't, they, they got to make it a, it must be a challenge to them to how much they can give every year. I got people, I've had people tell me that their goal is to give 50% of their income. You think God is upstairs like, bro, I mean, I can pay them back and reimburse them for 10%, but I don't know where I'm going to find all this blessing for 50%. No, you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. Why does God want you to have more? He wants you to have more because as a result, if you have more and you do with it rightly, the kingdom of God will expand. Period. Point blank. The, the reason why this church is in the se season of life that it's in is because faithful givers. Do you know if every person in this church gave, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a pastor's dream, right? Like if every person in, the, in, in, the, in our church services gave 10% of their income, we would have already bought a building with cash. It's just true. Like it's crazy how much money that is. But the reality of it is, is that a lot of us, we just don't take it. We'll leave today, and, and some of us, unfortunately, will leave today, and that'll be like win one year and out the other. And, you know, th next time, this time next year when we go into March and we have our giving series, y'all be hearing it again. You get it like on the tips, and then you won't do it. I know because I did it. Me, your pastor, every time I would do it, I would get convicted to do it, and I just wouldn't. Or I would tip. Listen, if you're tipping, praise the Lord, you're giving something. But can I just tell you, I went and looked at an $895,000 building on whatever day it was, Wednesday. I can't remember. It was 6,000 square feet. I tried every way possible mathematically to try to figure out how, <laughs> Madison, where are you at? You were there. I tried every single, she was hanging out with my wife. I, I tried every single way to try to figure out how we could fit a sanctuary in there. We can't. We need at least 15,000 square feet. Y'all think we're going to get there with y'all tipping like $5? Probably not. But it's because we don't take it seriously. We don't take, we don't take eternity seriously. It's the only reason we don't give. Hear me in that. That just came to my spirit. That's not in my notes. If we are not giving 10% of our income, we are not taking eternity seriously. There are people dying today in this city that are going to go to hell because a church doesn't have enough resources to reach them. I'm sorry, that's just true. And listen, I'm not manipulating, I'm not trying to manipulate you, so don't take it as that. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. And, and, and listen, when you, here's your solution to this, because it's not just sowing generously. Give me, like, give me specifically, Pastor, what do I need to do? You need to become a percentage giver. Do you know there's a reason why God doesn't say, give $250 a month? Because the reason why, let me tell you, because the reason why is that there are, are single mothers in here that $250 wouldn't allow them to put food on the table for their children. They only make $2,000 a month. 
That'd be more than 10%. They, can't, they literally cannot afford that. But someone else who makes $20,000 a month in here, like water, like they could do it, no problem. There's a reason why God doesn't give us an amount because it's not about the money. It's not about the amount. It's about the sacrifice. It's not equal amount. It's equal sacrifice. The person who makes $20,000 a month, hear me, it's the same sacrifice for them to give $2,000 as it is for the person who makes $2,000 a month to give 200. It's the same amount of sacrifice. God knew what he was doing. He said, make it a percent, not an amount. Because I want to give people who don't have $20,000 a month the ability to be blessed as well. You got to start somewhere. And I just tell you this, when I started tithing, I didn't start with 10%. I didn't think I could afford it. I started, my pastor said, I had a meeting with him because he knew I was struggling with it. And I asked him, he said, just start giving a percent that you can handle. I don't remember, I think it was like $20 a month. I think it was like literally like 2 or 3% of my income. And I started there. And I automated it. Every month it came out. And let me tell you something. It was hard. <laughs> Very difficult. Until I started noticing a major change in my life. God just started providing. I'm not talking about money either. I'm talking about he gave me a wife. He gave me the most beautiful children. You saw, see my daughter? Look at my social media. My daughter is beautiful. My, I put her on her in my story this morning. My wife sent me a picture. I have, I have, I'm convinced I have the best wife on the planet, the best children, the, the best church, uh, the, you know, the, I, everything I have, I'm blessed. I, no, I'm not a millionaire yet. I'm believing I'm going to be because I want to give more. The point is, is that God wants to bless you, but you have, to, you have to step into obedience. So this is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of your money in keeping with your income. That means percents. In keeping with your income. So guess what? The person who makes $20,000 a month, you're going to be more money. But you're not any more special than the person that's giving $200 a month in God's eyes. It's still, I believe that God still can... I, be, I believe supernaturally God can do the same amount of work spiritually in the life of someone with $200 as he can $20,000. I believe he can, spirit, he can multiply it in ways that would reach people the same as it would a big gift. So some of you, I'm just asking you, not, I'm not even asking you to be generous right now. I'm just asking you to step in obedience. And as a result, you're going to be blessed for it. So I wrote it down like this. There are two types of people. I'm almost done. i got to get out of here. we got to be out of here in 59 minutes, completely packed up. So please, I've got to go teach party with a pastor after this. If you can stay and help, that would be great. Um, my team would love you for it. <laughs> I am way behind. Um, first Corinth, or not yet. Um, there's two types of givers. There are people who tithe, and they say they're blessed. Now hear me. I love you, and I say this in love. If you are not giving 10% of your income, you are not tithing. So you don't fit in that. I'm sorry, unfortunately, you don't fit in the group I'm talking about right now. I, I don't mean that disrespectfully. I'm just saying, if you're, if you're like giving and your money's like, it's a lot of money for you, but it's not 10%, and, and you, you could say I'm not blessed, it's because you're not in that covering yet. You're not in that principle of covering of the 10%. So I'm grateful that you're doing it, and I'm grateful that God is working with you, but until you step into that 10% is when you're not operating in full obedience. So you're not going to be blessed in that in the way that God would, would, would want you to. So understand, if you are giving 10%, find a person that doesn't tell you they're blessed. I dare you. If a person that is in this room is giving 10% and you are not blessed, come see me right after service. It won't happen. I told the first service, and I, told, I, haven't, I haven't actually officially in writing asked the board for this, but we'd figure out a way. If you tithe for 90 days and you're not blessed, we'll write you a check for every dollar you gave. We'll do it. Because we believe in the principle of giving. I don't care how much money it is. We got savings. We'll reimburse you. I don't care. If you don't, if you tithe 10% to the dollar, I, you go into this category of protection, and guidance, deliverance. It's, just, it's spiritual. It just is. You ask the people that you tithe and they'll tell you. Then you have group number two. And that's, those of you, everyone that's in group number two is everyone that's below 10%. So if you're giving nothing or if you're giving 9%, you 
you're still in the same group. And you're, and you're going to be the people that say, I'm struggling. I'm having a difficult time. My heart's not right. My, my, my kids are sick all the time. My, my this, that, and the other. I don't, you're, you're just not going to feel blessed. And again, I'm saying this in love. I'm trying not to make it where it's like this ritualistic thing that you think it's a commandment. I'm going to say again, it's not a commandment. It's a principle. God wants you to be obedient with what you have, though, so he can bless you with more. Are you with me? Are you guys good? Is everyone okay? All super quiet. I'll just say this, because i got to quit. I'm almost, i gotta, I've got to be done. Some of you are struggling, okay? There's two, there's, I think there's no two groups of people. People are in here that are in debt, and you're struggling. Can I just tell you? God's going to take care of you. If you step into obedience, God's going to take care of care what it is. God's going to take care of you. And can I just tell you, if God has blessed you, hear me, as your pastor, if God has blessed you with resources and you are holding on to it, you cannot receive what you're holding on to. If you will open up your hand, if you are holding on to what God has given you, he cannot bless you. If you've been blessed, step into obedient giving. And I promise you, they're going to notice a drastic change. Again, I'm not teaching this. I didn't have a meeting with the board and say, hey guys, we're struggling. I need to go get, do a giving series. I play in this giving series in October. Of last year. I'm playing all my series for the whole year in October. I plan this. Like, we don't need it. I want you to be blessed. We need you to be blessed. That's why we're doing this. And as a result, I think if I got up here and we were in need as a church, I don't think God would bless us and I don't think God would would, would work on your hearts to, bl- to bless the church. I don't think it would work because we would be preaching something that we're not partaking in. Not going to do it. So we got to make sure that we're doing, I'm not asking you to do anything I wouldn't do. I, y'all got time for three testimonies real quick? Let me say, no, so too bad. Um, very quickly, I, these are, I asked the Slack channel, uh, our volunteers to say, hey, if anyone's got a tithing story, just send it to me. Some of you think, uh, I've been in a church where it feels very manipulative when they do this. They're like, read a testimony and they bring the music up real high and it's like, okay, give now. We're not going to do that. Okay? I promise you. But I do want to read this to you and then I'm going to pray for you. That's it. And then you'll have an opportunity to give. I don't want it to be based off emotion, but I want you to hear these are true life stories in your church. You're sitting with these people right now. Three of them. First one is this. We started tithing faithfully every week last fall. We were blessed with a wonderful career opportunity a few months later. Not instant. It was a couple months, but God did it. A few months after starting this job, we had an unexpected payout. Wow, imagine that. And a bonus check. Right at the time when we were financially struggling, God went before them, gave them a raise so that they could handle the struggle that they were going to go through because they were faithful. Testimony number two, different person. During a tough financial period six to eight months ago, we paused our tithing. Been there. I've done that. I don't, think I, can, I don't think I can make it this far. When I first started tithing, I, I still didn't get it. It took me a while. I paused it. So did they. This was a first in our marriage due to tight finances. Our car broke down afterwards, prompting my husband to take two jobs to pay off debts and save for a new vehicle. We decided to go ahead and resume tithing even though we couldn't afford it. My husband worked two jobs for two months. Shortly after restarting, our chickens began laying eggs. Now hear me. This is a true story. I didn't say you're going to get a check in the mail, but maybe your chicken might start laying eggs. It's a true story. Chickens laid eggs, debts were paid off, and we prayed for a reliable vehicle that we wouldn't have to take out a car payment for. A friend, unexpectedly, who knew, offered us the exact vehicle, the year and model that we wanted for a very discounted cash price. We bought it. Additionally, my husband was offered a new position at work, allowing him to quit the second job. Real story happened. It's right here in our church. It's God blessing the obedient. Last one, and then I'm done. This one's by a, a young a couple. They said, as a young married couple, we had very little. Been there. But when they had little, listen, this is huge. God's blessed them now. But when they were, had little, it says, when they had very little, we continued to be obedient in tithing because the first 10% was his to begin with. I should have let them preach. We were never paid.
paying our tithes, but rather giving back to God what was already His. Yes, you are correct. Early on, we decided to stay in a mindset of giving rather than scarcity. Living in a scarcity mindset would keep us in a place of, but what if I need this later? Or what if I won't have enough to pay for this or that? Instead, we decided to fully rely on God. Although we may not know all the time how we will pay for some things, God always provides. The majority of our marriage, we have had just what we needed. By remaining obedient to tithing and faithful to God's leading to give to others. So giving even above their tithe. We have seen the floodgates open over our lives in every area. This is exciting to us, not because it means that we have more, but because it means that we can give more to be a blessing to others. Come on, isn't that powerful? This is just give, getting so that they can give more. I love it. These are three different stories of three different families. And I had actually, I had probably 10 to 12 I could have read today. In a church this small, that's pretty cool. I would love for you to have the same testimony. But it takes a step of faith. It takes obedience. So my encouragement to you today, I had a couple things more, but I'm going to end it right there. I just want to, I want to challenge you in this. If God, there's only one thing that God says, test him in, and it's in your finances. He says, test me in this. I am challenging you. Just do it for 30 days. Excuse me, 90 days, three months. Good thing. 30 days is a little bit too short for you to notice. You 90 days of tithing, 10% of your income. Watch what happens. Just try it. There's going to be a QR code on the screen. It is a place for you to go and you can sign up to give. You can set up recurring. I encourage you to automate it. Don't think, do it and then be done with it and watch it come out. Then it takes all the other stuff out of the picture. Like you don't have to think about it. Like just do it. That's what I do. So I encourage you. Do it. It's going to be up there. Before you do that, don't do it yet. I just want to pray for you. Can I pray for you? Y'all stand to your feet. I just want to pray for you because God wants to bless you. And he just told me that I have to say this, even though it's 1210, I have to say this first. And y'all finish two more minutes. Luke 12, 16, 21. This is for somebody because the spirit of the Lord just told me to do it anyway. It says, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He got rich. He thought to himself, what shall I do with all of this money? I have no place to store it. He said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my old barns and I will build bigger ones. I will get a new savings investment account. I will invest more money. And and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Just take life easy. Eat and drink and be merry. Just don't worry about anyone else. Just take care of yourself. You've built a fortune. Like just just let your interest compound. Let your 401k build up and don't don't be generous. Just, Just just. Use what you have for yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? Verse 21, and this is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves and is not rich towards God. He didn't condemn the man for being rich. He condemned the man for being rich and using it only for himself. I want to challenge you. The hard words, but I'm your pastor, not your life coach. I want to see you blessed. It takes a leap of faith. 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 I need to get off the stage. It takes a leap of faith, okay? So let me pray for you, and then we're going to leave the, throw up the QR code, leave it up there. After I get done, I'm going to release you. But you can, you can scan that QR code, okay? So just leave it on the screen. So for people who want to set it up, also on your tithing envelopes, there's a little, someone's got, I don't know, there's tithing envelopes on all of them. You can, there's a little QR code. It's the same thing. Automate your giving. I'm believing, this is what I'm believing for. I'm believing that at the end of this, we're, this is part one, we're doing part two next week. I'm believing at the end of this series that I'm going to be able to testify to you guys and to the board of how many people automated their giving. And I think as a result, not only are you going to be blessed, but this church is going to be blessed. And you'll know you had a part in it. Amen? And every life change that happens as a result of this church moving forward will be because of your faithfulness. That's big. If one person gets saved and escapes hell for eternity because of your generosity, because of your obedience, how many of you know that's something we're celebrating? Let me pray for you. God, I just thank you for today. I thank you that these words didn't come from a pre- prepping. They didn't come from, you know, just sitting in a room and hoping something happens. They came from heaven, God. 
And I pray, Lord, that these words would not condemn anyone. I pray that no one leaves here feeling ashamed or guilty. I just pray they leave here with confidence and obedience, God. I pray that they just feel more responsible for their resources than ever before. And as a result, I pray for financial blessing on their life, God. God, you need to build your church. You want to do amazing things in this church, and it takes resources. So I pray, God, but not only that they would be obedient, but you would multiply the, 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 the resources in their life. I, I ask that if they are openly receive it, I would speak it over their life right now. Financial blessing over their home, over their family, and over the families they represent. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for what you're doing in the life of the people. We love you, God. We honor you. We praise your holy name. And all God's people said, amen.